Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's go to prayer. Psalm 98, Lord says to let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he will judge the world. We as your children are looking forward to your coming, but help us to remember that every day you delay is another day when people are coming into your kingdom. And we're looking forward to your return, Lord, and we know it's imminent. Help us to not only be expecting your coming, but to be busy telling others of your love and grace. Lord, again, we want to, to thank you that, that Carol is here with us this morning, and Roy, and, and Lord, we, we also remember, want to remember Pastor Duffy and, and his family as he's struggling with health and recently had a car accident. We just pray that you would undertake for, for them. We also pray for the family of um, Ashley Morrison as she passed away at a very young age, 32, and we just uh, pray for her family, and we just ask that you would be uh, comforting them. We pray for our, our military people and our law enforcement people, Lord, again. We again ask that you'd protect them as they protect us. We pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, help us to grasp what you'd like to teach us today as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in Galatians. And so I want to read uh, from Galatians chapter 1. This would be the, our second, second week in Galatians. I want to read chapter 1, 11 through 13. It says, but, make, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. So... Um, <clears throat> Again, we're, we're jumping into Galatians, and last week was kind of the introduction. I want to review a little bit, like we always do. Uh, the Galatian church was here in Asia Minor, and it was, uh, they were connected with Bithynia. And uh, the Galatian people were originally from Gaul, and they were... Uh, of a northwestern European descent, living in the lower part of what today is France. And last week I mentioned uh, that Asterix and Oblix, these were cartoons about the ancient people of northern France. If you didn't know of Asterix and Oblix, that was the cartoons I enjoyed when I was a kid. I guess that dates me a little bit. Warriors from Gaul were invited to move to Asia Minor by the king of Bithynia about 300 years before Christ. And Gaul being a land of druids and human sacrifices was obviously very animistic. And animistic uh, people believe that spirit beings and impersonal spiritual forces control the destinies of men. And these animists are not satisfied with life as it is, and they spend their time trying to manipulate the spirit world and get that to work for them. And dissatisfaction and frustration caused by animistic beliefs often makes tribal people open to the message of the gospel. However, after they come to accept Christ, if they're not grounded in the concept of grace... They can easily become involved in a performance style of Christianity. They start trying to appease and manipulate God just as they attempted to appease and manipulate their animistic spirits. Now this is the background of the book of Galatia, of the Galatians. And Paul wrote this book because the Galatians had moved from a grace-based relationship with God to a performance-based religion. 
And the key verse in Galatians is Galatians 4, 9 through 11. But after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to weak and beggarly elements which, to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. So the theme of the book, this book is Christian Liberty. And uh, Galatians has been called the Magna Carta of the church. And we ended last week with Galatians 1, 8, and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I now say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. And of course, that other gospel would be anything that would give you Rules and regulations you have to keep to approach God. You've got to wear your hair a certain way. You've got to wear your clothes a certain way. You've got to eat a certain food. Anything like that is another gospel. Paul understood that, that Satan would do all in his power to pervert the message of grace. And this is the most significant communication that was ever presented to mankind. Um, man can have a right relationship with God by grace alone. So he makes this statement. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now in Galatians 1.10 it says, For I do... For do I now persuade men or God? Or I, do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So uh, as believers, now we should be trying to influence people to turn to Christ. But the problem I see in Christianity is often there are a lot of brothers and sisters who only want to argue Christian doctrine with one another. Now I don't, I don't argue. Now, there are some hills, and grace is one of them, that I would die for, and some doctrinal areas that, for me, are non-negotiable. I attempt to state what I believe that the Word of God says, but if the authority of the Bible isn't accepted by someone, then I, I don't waste my time arguing. I take the same position that Paul did in in 1 Corinthians 14, 37 through 38, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you, and Paul was referring to, to his, his letters, things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Don't argue with him. And it's not, it's not our job to argue with people. But let's look again. But this is what he says. If anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. But let's look again at Galatians 1.10. For I do not persuade, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, we are here to persuade men so that... Uh, so what we say needs to be consistent with the Bible, with the Word of God. But, but Paul asks, for do I now persuade men or God? Now this is an interesting question. Is it even possible to, per to persuade God? We know from Scripture that God is not changeable, and therefore he cannot be persuaded. In uh, Malachi 3.6 it says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. And then in James 1.17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. Now, this truth affects all other truth. God never changes. Now, Paul continues on by asking another question. Or do I... Do I seek to please men? 
If Paul's desire was to please men, he would never have written this letter. Paul is challenging these Galatian believers on their worldview. And then he goes on to say, for if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Uh, if, you're, if your focus in life is on pleasing people, you'll never serve God. Pleasing men is, if that's your aim in life, pleasing people, and I should be pleasing men or women, you will continually vacillate from one position to another and still you will never please people because people are too fickle. In Galatians 1, 11 through 12, it says, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the gospel preached by Paul was not according to man. Could man have ever come up with an idea as amazing as the gospel of grace? Think about it for a moment. Here is sinful man, totally separated and alienated from God. He's without hope. And he's, he's described in Ephesians, and this is where we were all at, in Ephesians 4, 17 through 18, Paul says this, This I say, therefore, I testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, or the rest of those who aren't believers, in the futility of your mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. So this is a, a, a good description of unsaved man. So let's just look at, at these words here, the, the adjectives here. This is how we were. This is how people are before Christ. The futility of mind, understanding darkened, alienated from God because of ignorance and because of the blindness of heart. This is how we all started. This is how we're all at. And and that this is why I say nowhere in the wildest dreams, in his wildest dreams, could fallen man have ever come up with the gospel of grace. This is what makes Christianity different. It's not an invention by men. It's not an invention by somebody. They didn't think this up. The gospel of grace is not from man. And then Paul makes this clear. Only, only God could have instituted a plan like this to redeem the human race. And he did this before the foundation of the world. Deprived man or depraved man could never have come up with this plan. Well, well look at what God has done. And I'm not going to go over all the verses here, but I'm just going to, we're just going to state this quickly. Our sins have been totally forgiven. We are justified before God. Jesus Christ became our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We have been moved from being an outcast and separated from God to a position of being a joint heir with Christ and part of God's family. As a believer, I have access to God. And we're being conformed to the image of Christ. We are spiritually seated in heavenly places. We are given all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we not only have a place in heaven, we are to be seated at the very throne of God. This is where we will end up eventually. Now really, could a man have thought all of this up? True, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, but he was given this message by revelation of Jesus Christ himself. Look again at Galatians 1, 11 through 12. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So man, in his wildest dreams, could never have thought this up. 
And in Galatians 1, 13 and 14, it says, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. So see, as Paul is saying, I couldn't have thought this up. You know what I was like before. You have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and, and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul reminded the Galatian of his efforts to destroy the very thing which he was now preaching. His zeal for the Jewish religion and its tradition reached far beyond his fellow Jews. Now, tradition can be a really powerful thing. We have our own set of, of traditions in American Christianity. This church is a good example of this. In Indonesia, the missionaries tried to set their churches up like this because this was our tradition. Guess what? None of the tribal people would sit in the pews. They sat with their backs against the walls. All the pews were empty. Because in their culture, it's a sin to put your, turn your back to somebody. So they didn't want to be offending their brothers and sisters in Christ. So they sit in a circle. So all the pews were empty. Finally, the missionaries got smart and took the pews out. Just let everybody sit in a circle. So we have our own set of traditions in Christianity, and they are so powerful that we need to be careful to make sure that our traditions always line up with the Word of God. About 18 years ago, we revamped our bylaws here in this church, and we covered every item in the adult Sunday school class and decided there what we needed to change. And I don't know if you remember which item created the most discussion, but I do because it was such a surprise to me. The thing that created the most discussion was whether or not to continue taking up an offering or to place a box in the back of the church. We talked about this for a whole hour. Taking up an offering in the worship service is Western Christian tradition, but it's not in the Bible. And I remember one lady said, and you may remember this, she said, yeah, but our kids need to see us put money in the offering plate. And I said, well, take them back to the box and let them see you put money in the box. In the Bible, you'll find a box in the back. And Kent Ward very graciously made the offering box that we now have in the, in the back of the church. And now I don't think taking up an offering is necessarily bad, but it, it, is a, it is tradition. And it's part of our Christian, Western Christian culture. So we decided that to save time and not put visitors on the spot, because we didn't necessarily want visitors to feel like they were obligated to give, we would do what was modeled in Scripture, so we put an offering in the box in the back. We realized that we must be willing to step outside our own culture, even our traditional Christian culture, and compare that against the Word of God. Now, this may, may make us uncomfortable, because a society's culture is really its roadmap for life. But culture, even our Christian culture, can be faulty, and therefore we must Endeavor to always evaluate truth according to Scripture, not according to culture. Now, in the 60s and 70s, we saw the church involved in a culture war instead of evangelism. And I believe that this paved the way for the postmodern movement. That's my own humble but accurate opinion. <laughs> I believe that church is standing on culture instead of truth added to our cultural decline. But now let's look at Galatians 1, 15 through 17. It said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's, room and my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia 
and returned again to Damascus. So Paul starts giving us a little bit more of his personal history here. He said, this wasn't given to me my man. Man did not give me the gospel that I'm writing and, and sharing with you. And he gives us this little phrase. God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Now this statement brings us face to face with two great spiritual truths. And uh, with them two great questions that that have plagued Christianity. And, and because we, of the way we go through the Bible, you know, because we're going verse by verse, we don't ever skip over anything. We're going we're gonna to hit this. It, it, uh, the questions have to do with God's sovereignty and man's will. And God is totally sovereign. And does that mean that he chooses some to be saved and some to be lost? And how can he be sovereign if man has a will with which to choose. Well, knowledgeable Christian men have argued this topic for centuries. So this morning, I'm going to clear this up for you. So you don't have to worry about which one's right. Now, God is infinite, transcending our finite understanding. And, and God is... God is so far beyond us. He knows everything. He's, he's, ever, he's infinite. And we're finite. We're really limited. So God is infinite. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. And God has given man a will. He said, whosoever will may come for salvation. He gave Adam an evil will so that they could choose. And then he placed a tree of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden and told them, don't eat its fruit. So he gave them a will and then he gave them a choice to obey or not. God is sovereign. And he is so secure in his sovereignty that he can give mankind a will and not compromise himself. Can we totally understand this? No. But these are two truths, man's will and God's sovereignty, that are both clearly apparent all through Scripture. So, in my humble but accurate opinion, it is folly to argue those two points. Instead, accept them, because in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9, it says, However, we speak of wisdom among those who are mature, and yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We see mysteries all around us. And one of those mysteries is how God's sovereignty and man's will can coexist. There will always be some things we don't understand. And there will always be some portions of Scripture that, that we're not going to fully grasp. And we'll, that's going to be the, the, we're going to face that until we're on the other side of the grave. But I'm okay with that. I really am. I'm okay with letting God be God. And I'm okay with letting him be sovereign. And, and I'm okay with letting him be infinite and me being finite. I'm really good with that because I know God. And I trust him. And I know that I'm not always going to understand everything that he's doing. Well, let's look again at Galatians 1, 15 through 17. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, or, nor did I go up to Jerusalem 
to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now, Paul recognizes the role that grace has played in his life. And Paul makes a very profound statement here. He says, God called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. Now, notice, notice this is an interesting thing he says. He says, to reveal his son in me, not to me. Paul recognized that, uh, that he was a vessel through which the evidence of God's love and grace were going to be revealed to the Gentile world. Now, people, both saved and unsaved, see evidence of God's love and grace through the everyday lives of God's children, the believers, those, those who have accepted Christ. So the question I ask myself is, is Christ revealed in me? Do people see Christ in my life? Now, one morning in Indonesia, I got up and found that I was blind in my right eye. And we went up to the Conservative Baptist Hospital in Sarukum, and Dr. Farrell said, uh, he had me close my left eye, and then he said, what do you see? I said, nothing. And he said, this can be serious. And I already knew it was serious. He said, so I'm seeing, sending you to Singapore. So we ended up having to go to Singapore to an eye specialist who was probably the best in the world and who was able to help me. And we were, Janet and I, as usual, were really low on funds. And uh, we, we decided, you know, the cheapest place to stay in Singapore was the YMCA, so we went to the Singapore YMCA. And then a very strange thing happened. Somehow some Singapore Christians found out that we were there. And I don't know how they found out we were there. We hadn't ever been to Singapore before, other than maybe fly through and just hit the airport. But some Singapore Christians found out they were there and came to the YMCA, and they took us home. And this group, the group of Singapore Christians, started watching out for us. So it was after I went blind in my eye, became really unsteady on my feet. So they went with us everywhere. Uh, they took us to church with them, and they, they, but they made sure that there was never a time in Singapore that we didn't have a Christian brother or sister with us taking us where we needed to go. And uh, they paid our public transit fees. They took us out for meals. It turned out that uh, even the doctor that I went to was a believer. She was actually a very good friends with Dr. Farrell and, uh, at the Conservative Baptist Hospital. And she paid all our medical expenses. And before we, we returned to, to Indonesia, she took us out to dinner with her family to one of the most expensive clubs in Singapore. They truly met every need that we had. And we experienced Christ's love through this group of Singapore Christians. And I've often wondered, I really have, it's really concerned me at times, is the evidence of the same love they showed to me, is that same love evident in my life? If I knew that there was a brother and sister that was in Christ and in Ontario, they were there for medical needs and low on funds, would, would I go and take them into my home and do to everything to them that the Singapore Christians did for us? It was an amazing experience. At that time, I looked a little different. A lot of the Singaporeans thought I was Tom Selleck. <laughs> So I got my picture taken a lot with Singapore Christians. I don't know if I really looked like him or not, but they thought so at the time. So I just kind of went with it. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but... But really, I want the reality of the life of Christ revealed in me, revealed to me. But more than that, I want to be like Paul. I want the reality of the life of Christ to be revealed through me. And Paul said, said this in uh, 1 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. 
And then in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now, as believers, we, like Paul, should be able to say, follow me as I follow the Lord. Now, now let's look again at, at uh, just this part of these verses. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Uh, the revelation that he was going was to go to the Gentiles did not move Paul to seek the opinion of man. Not even the apostles. He didn't even go to the apostles. He was, he was to go to the Gentiles, and Jews didn't associate with Gentiles. So instead of seeking out the apostles, who were all Jews, this was a shocking revelation. So Paul went to Arabia, to Mount Sinai. He recognized that he needed to think and pray, and he went to that, to that place that was so significant in the history of the Jewish people. Because God had told him that he was going to do something special through him. And so Paul did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, but he went to the Lord instead. And in Galatians 1, 18 and 19, he said, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, what do you think Peter was, uh, or Paul was doing those three years? Uh, we know that Paul was a Pharisee. He was a biblical scholar. He had studied at the feet of Gamaliel one of the, the greatest scholars of his day. And I can imagine him on Mount Sinai searching the books of the Old Testament as he prayed for guidance. So after three years, he, he returned, went to Jerusalem, where he visited with Peter for 15 days and met James, the Lord's brother or half-brother, and in, uh, in Galatians 1, 20 through 24, it says, Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was no, unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were, were in Christ. But they were hear, hearing only that, that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So after, uh, after a short visit to Jerusalem, Paul began his missionary journeys. And he, he visited the churches in Judea, but they had only heard of him by name. And then in Galatians 2, 1 and 2, it says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Now, after 14 years of missionary work, Paul returns again to Jerusalem. And he realized that there was a, a danger of Christianity becoming divided between, you know, the Jews doing their thing and the Gentiles doing their thing. And we find that Paul always stresses unity, but he's not afraid of confrontation. And notice what he says. I went up by revelation. So he went up to Jerusalem because God had directed him to do so. And we know that uh, at different times in Paul's life, God communicated directly with him. The first time God spoke to him was at, at his conversion on the Damascus Road. Another time uh, when Paul had direct revelation, we looked at a few weeks ago in 2 Corinthians 12.2, where it says, I know a man who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And this, the indication here is that this was Paul himself. And also in Acts 16.9, it says, A vision appeared to Paul at night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So, so on several occasions, God spoke directly to Paul. 
But we have no idea how Paul received his revelation to go up to Jerusalem. It's enough to know that, that he went, that he was being led. Now we might ask, um, should we as believers expect God to, uh, to communicate with us in this, the same way he spoke to Paul? And I'd say, uh, I don't think so. At this time, we, we have the entire word of God. At our, at our disposal, and, and they didn't. So God uses his word. God, uh, God communicates to us now through his written word. Well, looking again at Galatians 2, 1 and 2, it says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and I took Titus with me, and I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might I might run or had run in vain. So, so notice what he did here. He said, I went up and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. Paul arrived in Jerusalem and he explained to the apostles what he had been preaching for the last 14 years among the Gentiles. But he he didn't talk to, this, to everyone, just to those of reputation, just to, just to those in authority. He wanted to know if what he was preaching was different from what the other apostles taught. The gospel that Paul taught was, again, the good news of the grace of God. And one of the reasons that Paul was given a revelation from God to seek out the other apostles was so that he would understand that his message was no different than what the other apostles had been preaching. Neither Paul nor any other apostle was stressing going back to Judaism, going back to the law. And in Galatians 2, 3 through 5, it says, Not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So even here in Jerusalem, there was danger that the gospel would be perverted. It said, false brethren secretly brought in who came by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ. Now these false Brethren came in to see Paul and his, see if, if Paul and his companions were keeping the letter of the Jewish law of which circumcision was part. And Paul calls them spies, false brethren. They had no understanding of grace. Grace tells us we don't have to jump through hoops to please God. The reason these, they, those false brethren came in was that they might bring us into, into bondage. They might force rules and regulations on us that God doesn't ask. They wanted to reinstitute the Mosaic law. And look at Paul's answer. He said, we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. There was, a, a, there was never a question about what was at stake here. It wasn't a matter of, of Jewish, of a, of, a, of a few cultural differences, but whether a right standing before God was attained by works of the law or by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. About 500 years ago, a man chose a, a life of conflict over a life of security because of this same truth. Then it was called sola fide. And sola fide means faith alone. The man was Martin Luther. And from studying scripture, Luther came to the realization that justification before God 
came through faith alone in Christ alone. And this was the issue that was at the heart of the Reformation. Luther's whole premise was the fact that faith had to be in Christ alone. Not faith in the church, not faith in good works, not faith in the priesthood, but Christ plus nothing. That's all you need. That's Paul's message. Now the issue in Paul's day, this was the issue in Paul's day, this was the issue in Luther's day, and this is the same issue that we have today. There are people who would pervert the gospel of Christ and turn it into a gospel of works. You have to attend church on a certain day and not another. You have to, uh, you have to wear, you have to dress a certain way, you have to look a certain way, you have to, to, uh, to do this or that, or God will never accept you. You have to eat a certain diet or God will never accept you. That's not the gospel of grace. If you find any, if you find uh, out, if you want to find out where any Christian organization stands on salvation, ask them how a person becomes justified before God. And if they tell you that a person is justified before God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it is what Christ did plus nothing, that organization believes the same gospel that Paul preached and all the other apostles preached. That's grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. That is all God is asking from you. He's asking from each of us, believe. Very simple. Just believe. Not believe and give 10%, just believe. Okay, thank you for listening.